Hey, Mark, we are releasing this particular podcast on December 22nd. I know we recorded earlier. So we're for those who cannot wait for the first day release to come out, it's December 22nd. And that's obviously three days before Christmas. It so is. I'm just, cur- I'm just curious about your Christmas plans as we wish our audience a very joyous Christmas. I have some great Christmas plans. I really do. Um, they were going to be a secret, but um, I'll go ahead and share it with you. Uh, I'm going to be coming down to Nashville on Christmas Eve and coming by your house. And I've got a very special gift. And I just want to spend Christmas Eve with you, Tom, and uh, just sit by the fire and, and uh, sing Christmas carols, just me and you, until we both drift off to sleep and wait for Christmas morning. So that's I've got my a little plan. bit. Of, I've got a little bit of challenge for you, Mark. What's that? I will be on the beach on Christmas Eve. <laughs> so, well, come on, well. come on, come on farther down, Mark. Uh, <laughs> Actually, all, of my gra- all of my grandkids and my daughters-in-law and uh, what do you call them? <laughs> sons. My three sons. Uh, yes. They're not they're not getting to our house to December 27th. So oh, okay. Nellie Joe and I have a December 17th anniversary. We're going oh. down to celebrate our anniversary. 45 years. Well, congratulations. That and is five awesome. plus years of dating, so 50, a half a century she has it, put up with me. It's unbelievable. It is totally unbelievable. That is awesome. Actually, well, our kids are coming over on Christmas Eve. They're going to stay all night at our house, our grandkids and kids, and then we'll all wake up on Christmas morning, and they'll all be here. And uh, so that'll be fun. So that's what we're looking forward to on our Christmas. But, you know, a couple of years, about every other year, the kids all go to their 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 other in-laws, and Jill and I have Christmas alone on that day. I love having the kids here on Christmas Day, obviously. But, yes. you know, I, I also love just having just Jill and me together on Christmas Day. It <laughs> Those days can be appreciated very they much. They really can, if you know how to appreciate them, if you know what I mean. I All know right. what you're talking about, dude. I know what you're talking about. Hey, this is the beginning of a three-part series. This is a three-part series for the next three weeks. Uh, fun may not be the right word, but I think it will be intriguing. I think it will be fascinating. We're going to talk about this topic of adoption. There are all kind of labels out there, replant, restart, but we're referring to a church becoming a part of the family of another church. In other words, the church assumes the assets, the church assumes the responsibilities of another church. You have done countless numbers of these, but we're going to talk about it from the perspective of the adopted church, not from the church that's seeking to acquire, merge, or adopt, but we're going to talk about it from the perspective of the adopted church. We are getting at Church Answers weekly questions about, I think our church needs to be adopted. How do we, what do we do? How do we know, et cetera? You are the global expert on this topic. There's no one that can come close to Mark Clifton on church adoption and so for these next three episodes, we're going to be talking about that. And think about it, Mark. In the past, if a church was headed in a steep decline, maybe on the precipice of death, it did not have any option but really to close. And that that was pretty much it. And through a, through a lot of different reasons, but I would say you are one of the primary reasons behind it, adoption or replanning has become something that is in the common vernacular right now. And I think when when Mark goes to meet meet his Lord face to face, those who are left behind will say, this is the guy who taught us about church adoption so churches could survive. So this is what this is a part of your big legacy, Mark. Now that's a big introduction and it's uh it's it's a lot to live up to. It's a, it's a lot to live up to, dude. I, I yeah, totally. Um man, I appreciate that. No, I do agree that for a long time there was no narrative that clearly described for dying churches what their options were. They really didn't know they had any. And and they didn't have any in some degree. There just weren't other churches willing to take them on. It was just not something we thought about, not something we understood, uh, not something that we did. And so dying churches usually just died and sold their building or maybe gave it to a denominational entity. And they felt really bad that, man, we were the last link on this chain, you know. But the reality is now, if you're down to 18 people, five people in the church like I was at, at Lynn, like I'm at at Lynn, Linwood, Kansas right now, there were three remaining members when Jill and I showed up and they wow. agreed to replant. Uh, 
you know, those three remaining members were three of the most important members in the 120 year history of that church, because those three remaining members said, you know what? We're willing to be adopted by another church. We're willing to reach out and let a, actually, in this case, let a couple of other churches uh, come along and adopt us. And we will we will relinquish, you know, leadership to these other churches and we will trust them that this is what Jesus wants us to do. And so last Sunday we had about 60 or 65 people there. We baptized well in the last uh, in the last uh, couple of years. The church has been remodeled inside and out. Uh, great mm. ministry going on. And so those three remaining members. Right. They're the ones in the history of that church that may be the most important members in that church. So rather than the the point of needing to be adopted or having adoption as an option as being a failure and a closure, and it's a tremendous doorway to a future that they never could have imagined. And oh, so I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Those those three may be more important than the founding members because they became yes. the future. They became the future members instead of yep. the founding members. That's, exactly. a, that's, a, that's an incredible perspective. Mark, you've heard me talk about my first church, just like you, we often have talked about our own first church. Mine was in Southern Indiana, uh, started in 1796. So wow. it was a church that was actually older than I am. And, <laughs> and uh, it, it had it had seven members and they were thinking about closing the doors. And I told them I would preach in view of a call because they had no one else to preach in view of a call. I preached. And they were still undecided if they wanted to close the doors and have me continue to preach. <laughs> which which will be the worst path for us to take. In fact, Mary Mull Mary Mulliken, one of the seven, said, I've heard a lot of bad preachers, but I think you're the worst. She told me that after my first sermon. <laughs> <laughs> so I was highly, I was highly encouraged on this first one. Hey, we're going to go into part one of this three part series. Once again, the series is how to know if your church should be adopted by another church. Part one, we're going to talk about the often tough and unspoken issues in church adoption. And Mark, I think you can address this first one fully. Most churches come to the decision when it's too late. Exactly. They they have they have already passed the point of really being able to make any other decisions other than we got to close. Uh, they should have made this decision earlier on when they still had some remaining resources, even still had some remaining uh, uh, people, uh, maybe mm -hmm. even some remaining relationships in the community. Often they don't come to this decision until all of those things are spent. And, and at the end of the day, there's nothing remaining. All right. Right. Uh, it would have been more healthy. It would have been better for them, been better for the community, been better for the adopting church. If they had made this decision while they still had some resource, some uh, personnel still around, some relationship in the community, maybe the building hadn't fallen into complete disrepair. All right. Mm -hmm. Maybe the air mm -hmm. conditioners and the furnaces weren't completely shot. I mean, sometimes they just wait until the, the bitter end before they agree. And yet they could have seen and maybe they did see two, three years earlier. The bitter end is coming. Yes. I mean, it, it, it's on its way. And, yes. and maybe this is the time. And, you know, it's a little bit like um, people who work with geriatric folks. Which, Our by friends. the way, that's that's who you and I are <laughs> right now. That's right. That's right. People who, who work with geriatric folks uh, have said that emotionally and in every other way, it is much healthier for older adults to make decisions about what they're going to do when they're incapacitated, when they're not incapacitated. Good point. When, when they still have some degree of control and they say, you know what, I think I want to go to this assisted living center and then and here, and this is what will happen. And you let your children know if I become disabled, I want to do this and those kinds of things. And you make those decisions, not after the fact, when you have no other choice and you're maybe not clearly thinking about what to do, but you make them better off. And but yet, Dr. Rayner, majority of us our age, we just don't make those decisions until it's too late because we just don't want to face that reality. It's never going to happen to us. You know, I having dealt with my my aged parents, uh, you know, you had to have that discussion. We don't think you can drive anymore. 
And my dad said, well, I think you're right. I'll just drive to the store in the post office. I think, well, you know what? That's still driving. You know, I, I don't know the fact that you can't see. You may memorize the route, but you still. There may be know. some people who walk right in front of you. <laughs> so, you know, but it was such a sweet thing. I know, Mark, you're right. I'll just drive to the post office. And, and it's a little bit like a dying church. You know, you go, you really don't have any options. I know, but we can do this for a few more months. Well, Probably not in a very healthy way. So that's kind of what I'm trying to try to say. So we're talking about how to know if your church should be adopted by another church. And this first part, part one of the series is the often tough and unspoken issues in a church adoption. Oh, by the way, Mark, my three sons talk to me on a fairly regular basis about my end of life decisions. They, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they, they said they're going to have a coin toss if I'm on life support and they need to pull a plug, you know, they can see, <laughs> you know, who, who, who will do that. And my youngest son who lives in the Nashville area with me, he said, make plans now, dad, because I will never change your diaper. I just want you to know. So we, you we had those conversations. You, you changed uh, his. Yeah, yes, I, that's it. that was my response entirely. There you go. So let's go to the second point. A few church members can stop the process of adoption. Right now, I know of a church that we're trying to help, and they have a church, healthy church, ready to adopt them. And of the, I'm going to say, dozen, maybe fewer members, there's one highly influential person that is basically saying over my dead body, and she means it. And I don't know how much longer she has, but... Uh, the church doesn't have that much longer. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, you know, there is a, a biblical precedent for that. The entire generation yeah. had to uh, had to die out right before they could get into the promised land. And they had to wait 40 years. And unfortunately, I think sometimes that's the situation uh, churches find themselves in. I have worked with a number of churches, Dr. Rayner, where you're right, the majority was ready to do it, but there was one or two individuals, one or two families. And and it's not it's not because at the end of the day, those one or two individuals believe with all of their heart that Jesus has a special plan for this church and it does not involve adoption. It's yeah. that they, they have this emotional, nostalgic attachment to this place. And <clears throat> excuse me, everything else in their life has changed drastically, right? When you get to yes. be that age, yes. <clears throat> the way you make a phone call, the way you buy things, your Sears is closed, Kmart's closed, your mall's closed, the way you get gas is closed. You don't go to a gas station. You go to a big convenience store. I mean, the whole idea of how everything is done has changed. Maybe even the, the company you worked for, your husband worked for their entire life is no longer even existence. Maybe that. Maybe that that entire uh, industry is no longer in existence. True. And and then you watch the news and you don't understand anything about what's going on politically. You don't understand anything about what's going on in the, in our nation and in in the view of of everything. The whole world is so different. But they can go to that church once a week and it's exactly like they remember it. And they hold on tightly to that because they're they're they. They have made that an idol. And among other things, yeah. an idol is something you run to for comfort, meaning, and security. And rather than finding their comfort and security ultimately in Jesus, they find it in the expression of church as they know it. And that's mm, a well very stated. powerful idol that, that we just have to. So when you approach these older folks like that, I want you to do so realizing where they're coming from. They're not just being mean to be mean. They're not just being hard-headed to be hard-headed. They're speaking out of a lot of hurt and fear and anxiety. And really the only way to address that is to help them warm their hearts to the gospel and to Christ and, and to realize that, that, that he is what they really want, not the church as they've known it and experienced it. And All right. I don't let me, know. Let me, ask you a real, let, let me ask you a real important question, Mark. Yeah. All right, I want you to listen. Do you hear the horn blowing in the background? No. Why? So good. One of my neighbor's alarm, car alarm's gone off, and here I am podcasting in my house, and I'm here. Bump, bump, bump. That was just a real important question I wanted to ask you. <laughs> although, although I do have a friend here with me. Uh, yeah. Hang on. Here he is. That's my buddy. He is a. Uh, oh, look at that cat. <laughs> oh, what's his name? His name is Monroe, like Bill Monroe. And he's okay, in my little box. He, he likes to sit in the little box where I keep my 
my uh, I, my uh, podcast equipment. So whenever I get my podcast equipment out, he uh, he gets in the little. There are so many reasons people tune in to revitalize and replant, and this is not one of them. Not one of them. You you would be surprised. That'll probably make that'll probably go viral on YouTube right there. You and I will never be viral on YouTube, but Monroe will be viral on YouTube. I mean, all right. We just we've just, we just heard the we've right. just heard the Monroe doctrine. The cat in the box is going viral. There you go. I just hope he's not doing anything in that box. He looks comfortable one way or the other. How to know if your church should be adopted by another church. Part one, tough and unspoken issues. Another tough and unspoken issue is this. Some of the members, no matter how many times you explain it to them, do not understand what it means to be adopted. They presume after the adoption, some things will still be the same, but they won't. And you can explain it multiple times. Yes, but the word adoption is incredibly helpful. In the past, we used the word merger, which was a ridiculous word. And I used it so many times, but it it meant nothing because you're not merging anything. Um, A friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, uh, had a heart transplant a few months ago. And uh, man, thanks be to God and to great physicians uh, he's doing wonderfully. I mean, it's just amazing. He was really at the point of, of, of probably death um, if things hadn't hadn't had a had he hadn't had the heart transplant. But he received a heart transplant, and he's doing very very well. You know, when they were looking for a, a donor, they they didn't go look for a, a 98 year old man with with chronic heart disease. I mean, there's no reason to put that heart in a good body. And so when you talk about a merger, there's no reason to take something that's dying and about dead and, hey, let's merge it with something healthy. Let's let's infect something healthy here. Uh, yes. That doesn't make any sense, right? right. Uh, so the merger concept, people brought into that said, well, we're going to merge. We're still going to be who we are. We're still going to have our corporate identity. We're still going to No, you're not. Adoption is what the picture is. And we'll probably talk about this in future podcasts as we go through this series. But when you think about adoption, one of the things about adoption, a merger, sometimes is you think of a takeover. We're going to get to, mm-hmm. you know, if two businesses merge, hey, I'm going to take the best assets you have and sell them off or bring them in. The rest of it we're going to get rid of, you know. But in adoption, you and I have worked with many, many, many couples who've adopted children. And it is the, they they desire deeply these children. I mean, some of them will if they're overseas adoption, they'll they'll make many trips overseas. They'll learn some about the culture. It'll cost them a tremendous amount of money. They'll make all kinds of adjustments. If it's a if it's a domestic adoption, you know, a, a newborn baby, they'll, they'll 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 decorate the room. They'll have a baby shower. They'll get all the stuff for a baby. The the most exciting day will be the day, that, and and to help. Churches that are being adopted realize, look, this adopting church deeply loves you, deeply wants you. This is not a takeover. This is you're joining a family. This is a wonderfully loving experience. However, when you are adopted, you do take on their name. You you don't lose who you are, but you gain who they are. And however you used to do Christmas, now you're going to do Christmas the way your adoptive family does Christmas. You're going to celebrate. You're going to go to bed when all the other children in the adoptive family go to bed. You're, you're going to eat. You know, it, it's, it's like everything changes. So it helps when we talk about adoption for the church to understand what is that a picture of. And I think it's a much better picture of what happens than merger uh, which is is not a or we used to sometimes talk about marriage. Two churches are going to get married. I never really liked that logo either. But right. I think adoption because it shows that the adopting parent deeply wants the child. It shows the child is going to be cared for and loved and taken care of, and someone else is responsible. And that child is going to receive a new culture. They're going to be without giving up their old culture necessarily. The new culture is going to be the dominant culture. Mark, this is a perfect segue. You had no idea how you were setting this up. (laughs) But I have an adopted grandchild. Okay. That grandchild was adopted by Sam Rayner, who coined the phrase adoption for churches after he adopted his child. Now, you cannot see it, but if you will look right there, 
Yeah. There's an, uh, it's a small picture on the screen, but there's an African American child right there, Dominic. And he has been adopted into the Sam Rayner family. That was when Sam said, that's the right illustration. That's the right metaphor for what's taking place. And it's stuck Caught for good reason. That's why. Good reason. Good reason. Uh, fourth reason or fourth tough and unspoken issue, not a reason. Tough. You, we, we alluded to this. If you wait too long, you have too much deferred maintenance. I know of a church right now, Mark, right now that three or four years ago would have been adopted readily. But when churches start doing their due diligence about adopting that, and they find that that church probably has over a million to $2 million in deferred maintenance just to get it normal, not, not, not modern, but normal. They're saying we can't afford to adopt you. That's why you sometimes wait too long. Oh, absolutely. And that can happen so quickly. You and I both know once the deferred maintenance reaches a point, it hits a tipping point. And something right. that might have been able to be repaired, like a roof or something like that, now has to be completely replaced. And they didn't have the money or the, the willpower or whatever to repair it when they needed to. So it's just or air conditioning systems. They've just kept kept trying to repair them and repair them and repair them. And they and they should have been dealt with a long time ago. Many things like that. So, yes, before you get to the point where you've got to replace everything, it is so much better for that church to come in and not have to deal with all of that. Likewise, the image in the community, uh, the social validation in the community, if the church still has some degree of, of life and vitality, then when the church is adopted by another church, it's not as though it, it's, it's, it's completely vacant now. They can, they can still come in and leverage what the community knows about the church and what the church has been doing to some degree. But oftentimes what happens by the time the church is willing to be adopted, they haven't done anything in the community for two or three years. Maybe they've offended the community. You know, they right. maybe they used to have the building open for some events, but because they don't have any money and any people, they don't do that anymore. So they've closed that off and they maybe they used to have a, a daycare or something and now they don't have people. They got to close that off. So now the few things they might have been doing, they aren't doing. So all of that would have been so much better two or three years earlier before the church was at really at the crisis collapse stage. Well stated. A fifth tough and unspoken issue that we're going to segue into episode 282, which will follow in a week, is the issue of emotional issues to take precedent over what needs to be done. We've connected that point at several points here, but we have it as a specific issue in episode 282. So for those of you who are our podcast listeners, our YouTube viewers, uh, we're going to continue the series, How to Know If Your Church Should Be Adopted by Another Church. Part two of this will be why potential church closures are becoming more common, and we'll touch upon that emotional issues when we get that. Okay, if you're listening to this on December 22nd when it was released, have a great Christmas. Have a joyous Christ-filled Christmas, and we'll see you on December 29th if that's when you come back and listen or watch this. We'll see you in the next episode.